then I'll transfer it over to Aminata. Good. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Pearson Bunsen, and we are having the immense pleasure of another McGill seminar in business and society. For those of you who have um, been to previous sessions, uh, you know we explore a wide range of topics that, uh, um, that really investigate and engage with the relationship between um, the organization of social relations these days and the role that business plays in it. That's a big spectrum. Um, and so far, we've been covering fantastic topics. Today's is no exception. We are particularly pleased today to welcome one of my colleagues. Uh, I think we rejoined with the difference of six months at the same time, um, McGill. Uh, Professor Rosenblum um, is a widely known expert in corporate law, specifically in comparative corporate governance. They've worked uh, um, in corporate law practice with Clifford Chance for a couple of years, then with Scott and Arps, and then spent, I think if my math is correct, 17 years at Pace at Hope School of Law in White Plains, New York, before joining McGill. And this is a paper that uh, they present today, co-authored with a colleague at UC Davis. And uh, as you will see, the paper has um, long legs and deep roots because uh, the paper engages with a topic that was um, the cri de jour for many, many years in comparative corporate law debates. But uh, what um, uh, the co-authors do with this paper takes the debate to another level, which is really important because the um, discussion around corporate pay, particularly executive pay, was largely driven by um, corporate scandal. And so at the heyday of dealing with the outpouring and the consequences of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act and uh, variously mounting critiques of um, shareholder value maximization principles, um, there was a lot of focus in also in the media uh, around the so-called fat cats and how many um, how many differences there are in pay between somebody who, say, pushes a trolley or delivers mail at a big multinational corporation and the CEO. Hundreds, in fact, uh, hundreds, 400 times more in some country, kind of companies. So the paper today that uh, Professor Rosenblum will talk about will take this debate to another discursive context, but not leaving the issue of pay itself behind, but placing it in the context of um, equity and diversity on corporate boards, which um, was maybe not really foreseen among the relatively narrowly confined um, debates around Sarbanes-Oxley, but now um, for many years now has been a really important topic. So it's fantastic that they've agreed to speak about their ongoing work on this topic and be our guest today. And we welcome you very much, Professor Rosenblum, to our McGill seminar on March 7th, a uh, Monday. Floor is all yours. If you could confine yourself to around 30, 35 minutes, that'd be appreciated because from what I gather, the students are drowning in appointments. And um, so maybe then the whole session will last like an hour, maybe an hour and 10 minutes, but then we should let them run off to do the other things, including writing outlines for us and papers and things. Okay. That's perfect. Thank you so much for that generous introduction. Uh, I'm really <clears throat> sincerely grateful to have the opportunity to share this work. It's actually an opportune moment, even though the piece was recently published, um, we've been getting a lot of attention for it because it's appearing in a few different uh, widely read business law blogs, including the Oxford blog, uh, and I think it might be coming out soon in Colombia. And we've been doing some podcasts about it, which should be out soon as well. Um, I'm gonna do this presentation a little bit differently than I typically do it, because I don't know, uh, Professor Zumbanson, if you've uh, delved into the executive pay controversy with your students. So I wanna give a little bit of background on that um, 
on that discourse before I jump in. The paper doesn't really do that. The paper really was crafted as, and, and for the students, I think it's worth noting that this is what I think of as a good essay in law in the sense that it's a relatively tight paper. It doesn't go incredibly deep. Our goal with this paper wasn't to categorically prove a thesis about the necessarily necessary correlation between gender and pay. It was rather to pose a question about it. And as such, we don't really um, fully cite the literature on executive pay. But as Professor Zumbanson noted, this is a longstanding controversy and perhaps one of the hottest controversies in corporate law, particularly in the US uh, where uh, executive pay, as he noted, uh, often surpasses 400 times the average worker. It's worth noting, um, and this was a recent controversy that I explored, um, uh, that I'm thinking about writing uh, an op-ed on, um, uh, that's um, Tim Cook, who uh, is, is the CEO of Apple, uh, recently got a pay package of $99 million, um, which is extraordinarily high, but perhaps fair given how well Apple is doing um, where, you know, in the pandemic. However, it's still a shocking number that has drawn a lot of attention. And the relevant number isn't the hard number. I think it's the it's the actual ratio that's the most relevant piece. How does it compare to other people who are also working full time for the firm? Uh, and in his case, it's like 1400 times the average worker. And note that that's the average worker for Apple, but that they outsource the manufacturing of all their goods. So if we were to include all the people who actually work on building our iPhones and our, our Macs, um, I'm sure the number would be astronomically higher um, because those workers are paid far less still than the average Apple worker. So we're dealing with a situation, and, and I use Apple as an example because I think it's a pretty um, uh, tangible one for all of us and so many of us use their products. Um, a situation in which the people who are running things make this astronomical sums, uh, which are really not just uh, novel within the corporate sector today, but I think it's safe to say in all of history that these are the most highly compensated people uh, for a regular job. That is to say, certainly emperors made more money through uh, grand conquests um, in which they would, you know, plunder the, the conquered. Um, but in a regular job, in a regular organization, these people are making enormous sums of money and that, and that amount has been the center of a huge debate over whether it was excessive, whether it was unfair, whether there's any way to justify it. Uh, what the cause of that expense was, whether it was a good service to the firm to pay that much for people. There were many people who defended these salaries, arguing that basically this is a free market and uh, the, the corporations operate in a market, uh, a, a capital market of, of high-end labor. And that high-end labor was so scarce that it demanded these kinds of salaries, right? Um, and, and that was sort of, I think, the traditional law and economics line. And then some people pushed back against that, including Lucian Babchuk and some other people who argued that there was some capture going on here, that the managers of these uh, enormous firms, and mind you, that work was happening, say, 15 years ago or so, um, but the problem has only become much more substantial uh, in recent years as we see capital becoming much more centralized, 
um, with the rise of um, these enormous uh, tech companies like Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, etc. Um, so uh, at that time, the pushback that Bebchuk gave was to say that this is capture by the managers, that basically they have um, set up a situation in which they have um, uh, control over the firm, and then they extort these enormous sums from the boards in order to um, get these jobs. Um, even though there was some pushback from, I think, highly, well, highly regarded mainstream legal academics, there was really no change in the law on this. Uh, the Dodds-Frank Act in the U.S. Uh, allowed shareholders to um, vote uh, in a way that would be uh, uh, an optional vote and that would not be binding on the firm um, to say whether they approved of the, of the um, pay compensation. The idea here was that transparency, um, as with much of corporate regulation, would do the work of government by revealing to investors what was really happening. But it didn't actually change things because pay kept skyrocketing. Um, so in this paper, what we really do is insert ourselves into this debate. Professor Afsharipour and I um, both work in corporate law. We're both interested in diversity questions. We both have focused for a long time in particular on gender issues within the within this space. And so we started asking ourselves, is it possible that there's a link between the domination uh, by men of the corporate elite and the fact that they are so highly paid? So this is the question that we start with. And it's our, um, our answer to an invitation to the people who are interested in the say on pay uh, corporate compensation debate. So um, the, the roadmap of, of my talk today is really going to be to first talk about the facts, uh, then to talk about some potential explanations, uh, which we uh, cobbled together, and then last to talk about how this might um, affect policy choices that firms could make and that governments could make to grapple with the uh, excessive astronomical pay that's going on. So I don't have a ton of slides, so don't fret. Um, I'm going to go through my slides uh, and then I'm going to um, open it up to questions and, and have some discussion uh, for two reasons. One, um, as I said, the paper is uh, more of an essay. But also, I think part of what we try to do in this essay is to open up space to ask questions about what could be happening. And so I'm genuinely curious to hear what the students think in this regard. Um, so I've already shared with you the general picture of executive comp, that executive comp is, is, has run amok, right? Um, as Professor Zumbanson said, the average executive comp for many, I think in, in the US is over 400 times the average worker. In other developed countries, the numbers aren't quite that egregious, but they're not great. Um, and regardless, there's a secular trend, whether you're looking in the US or in other countries, of a sharp rise in pay at the very top of the scale. Um, this is reflective of a broader trend in our economy, not just in the corporate sector, but in many sectors in which the most highly paid people are paid exorbitant sums while average workers get away with relatively limited compensation. We see this on law faculties. We see this at law firms. We see this among large corporations. Um, we see it among foundations, right? So, you know, the top foundations like the Ford Foundation uh, executive director makes uh, a fortune, right? And this is, so this is a commonplace thing. 
throughout our society that there's a vast level of it, of increasing inequality and the corporate sector is not an exception here. But what we try to do in this paper is really to try to frame it in a way that reflects some other dynamics, notably gender. Um, and I want to underscore that while we focus on gender, surely we could make a similar case to describe racialized differences, um, nationality differences, class differences, et cetera, which also clearly make up a source of a great deal of inequality within the corporate elite. But when we look at the C-suite, men occupy over 92% of all CEO positions. And so when we think about it in that sense, um, women are only 8%. That means that men are something like 18 times more likely to get a CEO position than a woman. And so it's extraordinarily rare that women rise to the top of the corporate sector. Um, that number is inclusive of a fairly large number of firms. But if we look at the very top elite set of firms, it's even more rare for women to take on a leadership role. It's just this past year that a woman, Jane Frazier, took on the responsibility of serving as a CEO of a major bank at the global level. Um, that was Citibank. Um, so women are pretty excluded from this context, uh, even though for decades and decades, of course, they've composed half of business school grads and have been moving up the ranks in the corporate sector quite nicely. But when we get to the top of the sector, there's just a vast exclusion. Um, it's so stark in the court in the CEO in the CEO space that there are more men named John or named James than all women CEOs combined. And that's either or. So there are more John CEOs or more James CEOs than all women combined, right? So even just drilling down to one specific first name, there are more men than all women, right? It's pretty stark when we look at the numbers. Now, when we look at the board more broadly, the numbers are a little bit more capacious. They're around 20%, some, in some jurisdictions, it's a little bit north of that, uh, as it is in Canada. In some countries like France and Norway, Norway, where they have a hard quota, um, the numbers go even higher, um, uh, approaching around 40%. But women basically are largely excluded from this space. It's not that much better outside the CEO position. So women are only about 14% of CFO positions and 15% of other profit and loss positions. Um, so profit and loss, by that we mean divisions of the firm that actually generate money and not just, you know, the chief legal officer or the general counsel or the person who heads HR. Those positions tend to be um, more commonly held by women. Um, now, um, uh, while this persistent gender gap um, is really relevant, there are outliers that some women CEOs make more than male CEOs, um, but that more broadly speaking, there's a, gis a generalized discount uh, in pay for women um, among named executive officers. So if we include CFOs um, and uh, chief um, uh, COOs and other, other positions in the C-suite. So before I move on to part two, I just wanna again summarize the current state of play. We're living in a world in which men, in, in which one, executives make uh, a fortune compared to almost everybody else. Two, almost all of those executives, the CEOs, are men, right? So that's the factual background into which we enter with some theoretical ideas that might perhaps explain what's going on. 
So we have three theories here. One is a focus on the nature of masculinity in the C-suite. So here we want to uh, invite readers to think about what are the ways in which men behave in these corporate contexts? What are the typical attributes of these men? And how does that affect the way in which um, men are chosen to occupy C-suite positions and the ways in which they're compensated for that labor? Okay, so um, what do we mean by this? Well, certainly we're referencing the old boys network, the place in the, in the corporate sector in which there's a very specific elite, that elite has a lot of power, and they define not only how the corporation operates and the rules that it operates by, but also who replaces them themselves, right? So they set up the skill sets that define what constitutes effective performance on the job. Um, so what is that effective performance? It is um, serving as uh, a CEO. It, it plays into masculine tropes of performance, being aggressive, um, being outspoken, um, taking risks, all of these things are skills typically associated with men and that um, are valued by the corporate sector. Rosabeth Moss Cantor, uh, a business anthropologist uh, from Harvard, wrote a great book called The Men and Women of the Corporation um, uh, about 40 years ago, in which she described a sort of homosocial reproduction, a way in which the men running the firm self-reproduce and create replacements for themselves, who basically mirror their own values and performances. This is what we're talking about masculinity in the C-suite, okay? Now, what does this mean in terms of how they actually compete against other people within the corporate sector? So there are a couple of theories here that we think are relevant. One is tournament theory, the second is capture. Um, so tournament theory is basically about how games are played among uh, in leadership contests. And so it's really a, a, a specific version of game theory. And what tournament theory explores in this sense is when there is a competitive uh, circumstance, how do different people react to that competition in different ways? One thing that we know is that um, there are substantial differences among people in how they compete. That men and women compete pretty similarly in general tournament circumstances. That when they are doing work at a workplace, even leadership work, they sort of do similar things and succeed at similar rates. But there is some evidence within tournament theory that suggests some gender disparity, which is this, that men tend to outcompete women when we're talking about um, a context where there's very high level, a very high level of uncertainty. And that in uncertain situations, men tend to perform better. Now, we could come up with a whole variety of explanations for this. Um, my hunch is that it links back to notions of risk and gender. There's a lot of literature about this. I don't think anything uh, in this literature is uh, totally conclusive, but it's quite persuasive that men are better at risk taking, they're prized for their risk taking, and women are punished for risk taking and prized for their aversion to risk taking. So that there's a very gendered way in which men and women perform in a different way with regard to risk. And that plays out with this issue of uncertainty. Now, here's a good point for me to say, uh, and you know, I'm non-binary. When I talk about men and women, I'm talking about cisgender men and women.
largely talking about heterosexual cisgender men and women. I just want to underscore that as a, a baseline for what I'm talking about. I don't mean to draw any presumptions about who these men are or about the natural nature of the gender binary. I don't think it's natural, but I do know that in this corporate sector, the elite is one that largely excludes people who are gender nonconforming in any respect whatsoever, including among traditionally gendered men. Um, the masculinity that is prized uh, is a very specific, uh, almost macho kind of masculinity um, that, that succeeds best within this corporate sector. So anyway, getting back to tournament, and tournament theory, what we're talking about is how uncertainty favors men and that uncertainty creates a circumstance in which during the game that is played in middle management, men tend to do better at these kinds of uncertainty. As we already know, based on what we've talked about a moment ago with regard to masculinity in the C-suite, men who run these firms tend to choose their replacements by picking people who have similar skills to themselves. One of those skills is attitudes toward risk. And so these men who outcompete women with regard to uncertainty tend to then rise to the top of the firm's hierarchy. Now, how does this play out in terms of the C-suite once the men rise to the top of the hierarchy? Well, once they're there, they capture the firm. Now, this goes back to Lucien Bebchuk's uh, own argument. He was talking about how managers capture the C-suite and capture the governance of the firm. He was describing that in contrast to shareholders and stakeholders. Uh, Professor Afshari Poor and I are talking about it in contrast to women within the corporate leadership structure who could be candidates for potential positions in the C-suite. So basically, masculinity reigns within the firm. That's the first thing. Second, this kind of masculinity outcompetes women with regard to uncertainty. How does that help them in leadership positions? Because these positions are often defined by the uncertainty that comes with being in these C-suite positions. Where do we see this? We only have to look at recent history with the pandemic, right? That firms had to switch uh, at the drop of a, of a hat uh, from one strategy to a different strategy in order to source their goods to distribute their goods, to find workers to do the work that needed to be done. This kind of uncertainty is one that creates a huge driver within the firm's leadership. And this is something that goes way back to Moss Cantor's own work uh, on the role of uncertainty in leadership and how valued it is for people to be able to grapple with that level of uncertainty. So men get into these elite positions through tournaments, um, but once they're there, they capture it. Now, what is capture theory? It's basically the idea that there's some sort of public resource out there that is grabbed by a small number of people and they grab hold of it in such a way that they don't have to share it any further. Now, is are CEO positions a public good? No, they're held by private firms. Um, they, they're private entities, so it's hard to say it's a public good, like access to water or air or um, intellectual property or something like that, right? Um, it is privately held, but to the extent that the firm exists thanks to the state, that the firm's uh, limited liability status is one that only um, uh, exists with that support of the state, 
that the leadership of the firms is also to a certain extent a public good. If we think of these positions as the highest paid jobs in the world, then we could think of it as a sort of public good. And the fact that men are capturing these jobs is a form of capture. They've grabbed these jobs, they're holding on to these jobs. And when we think of capture, it's basically often driven by the ability to extract rents from a, a broader public good. So what is the rent here? It is the salary paid to these executives. So there's a huge incentive for these men to engage in this kind of capture because they get to be paid in these extraordinarily astronomical fashions, right? So basically masculinity functions as a cartel. They dominate this context. They trade in their masculinity in order to maintain their dominance over the firm. And that leads to a continued world in which women are on the outside. Now let's get to the last part and then I'll turn to questions. Um, so anti-discrimination law does not remedy this problem, right? We've seen that there's been an active, vibrant move to um, prevent discrimination from occurring over the past uh, 50 years in the US and certainly in Canada and in other countries um, for many, many years. And yet in these elite positions, discrimination on wages is still quite rampant. Corporate governance likewise has largely failed to grapple with this level of inequality. There's been disclosure with regard to executive pay now for quite a few years and it hasn't really changed the compensation structure. There's been a lot of shareholder pressure on this front, and still there's not a lot of change. There have been quotas and other remedies like California's mandate for inclusion on corporate boards for women and people of color and LGBT people. And these legislative efforts have also not, um, not completely changed the landscape. There's some suggestion that recent bills have been successful, but we really need to start thinking about what can the law do to reverse the capture by these men of this great corporate wealth. So here I wanna uh, come to my conclusion. So what Professor Afsharipour and I wanna do is we wanna reassert in our conclusion that these thoughts are Severely that. They're suppositions of a theory that could explain the undeniable fact that there's extraordinary uh, uh, overpayment of men within this context, and that men dominate this sector in ways that are uh, not budging significantly, right? So we have this fact. We apply the theories that we see as relevant, tournament theory, capture theory, understandings of masculinity in the C-suite. And we suggest that we think there is a sharp likelihood of a correlation here, that it's likely that masculinity is partly driving this kind of inequality. We've seen the reverse of this happening in other fields like nursing and teaching, which had at one point been male professions and as they became feminized, the compensation dropped, right? So we see this playing out in gendered ways in other contexts. We have no reason to doubt that that's what's at play here, but we invite other scholars to come up with both empirical explanations for what's going on and theoretical discussions of whether our hunch is correct or not. And so I'll stop there. I look forward to your questions and comments. And thank you again, Professor Zumbanson, for this opportunity to share our work. I'm gonna stop the share now. Darren, I started this professor thing <laughs> but because I never know who all our guests are. I say professor, but now you're just as formal with me. 
So, Professor uh -huh. Rosenbuben, dear Darren, thank you so much for this um, talk. <laughs> very lively, very interesting. Okay, floor is open. Are there questions or comments? I should say, as there are questions and comments, the floor is, of course, open. Like I said, the students, I think, are multitasking, to say the very least. Um, they like do seven things right now at the same time. So as some of them might collect their thoughts, I'll kick us off with a quick question, of Darren, if you allow me. Um, yes. In terms of contextualizing the approach that you um, have chosen, I'm not sure I understand what the um, what the anchor is. So in terms of making parallels to feminist legal theory and then you know even emancipation before that, um, those movements have gone through so much change and the recent I think surge in placing equality debates in a larger political economy context, I think has really done good in terms of maybe getting out of an rat race where one tries to achieve the same, but rather where one tries to argue, and that's really different than the, um, and I cannot remember her last name, but this very famous anthropologist, Carol, the famous, um, she was studying under Goldberg and then the famous study book came out in 1984. Gilligan? Gilligan, yes, of course. Um, to argue that it's not about being different, but that the world actually requires not just being more like a woman, which was still at the Gilligan stage, but being different altogether. So the current political economy, of course, um, must shudder at the idea that we now want to have more people earn such outrageous sums of money. Although that might be nice for interim, you know, achievement and success, of course or at least have men earn less. But I wonder what the political economy context is of this approach, right? And what you have in mind in terms of your conclusion or prescription. That's such an important question. So I have a piece that sort of, um, I think, um, suggests an answer. It's uh, about, I forget what it's called, it's about transatlantic uh, divergence uh, in corporate governance. I co-authored this with a French law professor. And in the piece, we sort of proffered the theory that basically as Europe was adopting more remedies for inclusion of women, that it might make firms more stakeholder oriented um, and increase the divergence between governance that's shareholder primacy driven in the US and uh, with the European context. I don't know that that's the case, but there is some data out there that women leaders tend to be more stakeholder oriented. And so I think that provides a partial answer to your question in this regard. If we imagine that that's true, that women are more stakeholder oriented, then we might think that it's likely that these women, when they reach this position, are going to run firms that eschew astronomical compensation. Because typically, someone who's stakeholder oriented is going to be much more interested in having a slightly flatter hierarchy within the firm. So I suspect that that's the case. I don't know that there's clear data about that. Um, a lot of this research is challenging in the sense that to some extent it relies on cultural feminist norms, to go back to your reference to Carol Gilligan. Uh, to some extent it relies on data that traffics in stereotypes. And there's a lot of research out there, um, including my own empirical research, right? that says that women on in corporate leadership are like this and men in corporate leadership are like that. And of course, these are to some extent stereotypes. They don't apply to everybody, but there is nonetheless some evidence 
for example, that um, women, uh, that firms that have more women on boards are less likely to fire workers during, during an economic downturn, right? Or that women on boards are, are slightly more risk averse or that women on boards are more methodical in terms of the way they deliberate about core issues, right? So I think these pieces answer in part the LP question of uh, where's the political economy uh, takeaway. I think the answer is that when we think about exclusion of women within this context, if we actually remedy it, I suspect that executive comp would come down, or at the very least, ratios would shrink. But who's to say, right? We don't we don't know that for sure. Fascinating. So imagine we had had women run the companies in Smith Van Gorkum. Yeah, they would have been method methodological and. Smith van Gorken would have had a different outcome. The case would never have happened. Yes. And we would miss decades of business judgment rule case law. That would be fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. There is somebody arguing that now in, there's a book called Feminist Judgments of Corporate Law and somebody is writing about, it's basically a book series in which people rewrite oh, yeah. decisions. Yeah. And so someone's writing up one about Smith versus Van Gorkum oh, with, good. That, with that very theory in mind. That's good. So I still have some. Yeah, good. Yeah, good. Other questions, comments? Any yes. other questions? Yeah, yeah, hi. Go ahead. Hi there. Um, I was just wondering if, uh, if you could expand upon uh, part three. I found I found the whole thing very interesting, and I was just wondering if you could expand more about what um, legal remedies you see to, to this problem. Oh, uh-huh. Sure. So part three is really um, short in the piece. We could have gone much deeper with it, um, but we also, you know, individually have written about that in other places. So I've written a lot about quotas for women on corporate boards. France and Norway have uh, a floor level of representation that's mandated for corporate boards. Canada has a comply or explain norm in this regard. Other countries in the common law system follow that norm, generally a comply or explain rule. Recently, California started regulating um, diversity on boards as well with regard to not only gender, but in a separate statute, um, race and LGBT identity. So I do think um, mandates of some form to encourage inclusion at the board level can play an important role. Why? Because the board is the entity that chooses the executive, right? The shareholders elect the board, in turn, the board selects the CEO. And that process of what they do is really crucial here, right? So, for example, to reference Jane Frazier, who's the CEO of Citibank, one of the reasons that perhaps she um, came to um, run Citibank is because the head of the nominating committee at Citibank within the board was a woman herself. So I think board diversity does matter in terms of putting people in these positions. Um, and, and the way to achieve that is through uh, regulation, I think is a big, a big way to push for it. Other remedies exist though. So uh, I've written about term limits that might foster diversity. Um, in the US, they're very rare, but in other contexts, they're much more commonplace. This is a piece I co-authored with Yaron Neely, who's at University of Wisconsin Law School, uh, called Diversity by Term Limits, question uh, mark. And we draw on empirical findings that suggest that, um, that firms, um, that higher levels of, of inclusion of women correlate with lower levels of tenure. That is to say, firms that have higher turnover tend to bring more women in uh, in leadership roles. 
Um, so that's one other remedy. Another is uh, a piece that I've uh, written recently, published recently with Anat Alon Beck and Michal Abben Gonan, who is a, 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 Anat is a, another law professor and Michal is a, an Israeli judge. And in that piece, we argue that there's a fiduciary duty to diversify, that firms have an obligation to diversify and that it's a key part of good governance. There, the argument is really that basically without diversity, firms fall into some sort of group think in which there's a group of people that's very similar to each other. They capture and control the operation of the firm and deviate from what's actually most efficient from the, for the firm, okay? So I think those are a few examples of remedies that could take place. Um, but disclosure certainly on executive comp is also an important piece. Um, and I think it could be more public. Um, there's been a lot of disclosure already, but I don't think it's gone as far as it could in terms of making people fully aware of the extent of the compensation that's going on. So that's a wide range of remedies, all of which avoid dealing with anti-discrimination law as such. Great, thanks so much. You're welcome. Any other questions? Well, Sheila and Dee, who knows? Other questions? I will say this just to link it back to the transsystemic piece at McGill, that I do think that, it, you know, as a further answer to your question, Matthew, I think the remedies that are going to be the most effective are going to vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, so that in some jurisdictions, uh, a softer remedy is going to prove more effective in other jurisdictions. A harder remedy is going to prove effective. It does seem, however, that the complier explain rules with regard to gender inclusion tend to have been less effective than harder remedies uh, such as those passed by Norway and France and some other countries. Um, but I do think all of this, you know, since since the executive comp question and the gender inequality question both traverse national boundaries in every direction, it is worth considering the cultural and national specificities uh, of governance that are gonna be relevant in coming up with remedies. At one of the consultation rounds for the Rocky principles that took place in Canada, there were a number of corporate lawyers, a small one, that were arguing for this to be part of the um, what would eventually become the principles. And there was a lot of resistance. Right? The uh, mainstream corporate lawyers, even if when we had tried to invite not just the you know naysayers, but they were basically talking about this, you know, in a they said, well, that will never work and quotas, you know, Calover and you can't right. put any of such slightly foundational rights, human rights, charter rights, any of this into a, into the big proximity of corporate charters. Anyway, so fascinating area of work. Are you optimistic? I am optimistic. I think that, um, I think that there are some other changes going on that will lead to added pressure in terms of inclusion. So for example, David Weber and Christina Sauter and Sergio Gramato and some others have been working on, Michal Barzuza, have been working on the idea that millennial investors are much more stakeholder oriented. Um, and I think that could play a role here um, in terms of pushing firms to be more focused and engaged in diversification of leadership. Um, I think younger generations have higher demands and expectations mm 
uh, of the notion of diversity as a core element of legitimate governance. Essentially, I think for younger generations, the notion that an entire governance system would be all white men, you know, straight white men, cisgendered, um, is, is not evident, right? People are starting to ask those questions of representation. And I think largely, not always, but largely in a salutary way, which I think pushes the debate forward. The flip side to that question, though, is the inequality issue. I do think inequality is still on a sharp rise. It'll be interesting to see with a Democratic administration here in the U.S., whether they start to rein in the corporate sector um, in some way. Certainly, they've hired some promising people like Tim Wu and Lena Khan, who are aware of the ways in which large firms manipulate the economy, these large tech firms. Um, but we'll see how it plays out uh, in terms of uh, actual governance of those firms and of the broader economic system. But for now, it looks like both diversity is improving and inequality is increasing. So the question is, where is that going to play out in terms of the, the inevitable conflict between those two ideas? Aaron, thank you very much. That was a great My seminar. My pleasure. Thank you for the invite. Uh, and thanks to your student for questions. And um, obviously, if you have questions, please feel free to email me uh, at darren.rosenbloom uh, at mcgill.cea. Okay? Yes, because this is the rare opportunity where we have our speaker actually close by and not like in many other times in Hong Kong or Paris or Berlin. Yes. So that's great. Thank you so much, Darren. Thank you. My students, pleasure. And Thank see you, you again. All, soon. all right. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye.